My name is Cy Adler, Interim Dean, College of Urban and Public Affairs. Welcome to another in the series of panel discussions we've been having inspired by the 50th anniversary of the Portland Downtown Plan, a plan within which Portland State is designated an urban university, a university that is in and of its place. This one's about downtown Portland as a commercial center, office and commercial activities, their development was a key goal of that 1972 plan. And there isn't a more important issue to talk about than the future of downtown as a commercial center in light of what's been going on here and is happening now. What it looks like, what it might look like in the future. So I will introduce panel moderator, Professor Greg Schrock, director of the Toulon School of Urban Studies and Planning. Uh, Greg is both a scholar and a practitioner in the field of economic development. Greg will introduce members of the panel, speak, panel members will speak, they can talk amongst themselves when they're done, and then we'll open it up for questions from those of you here and those of you Zooming in. Uh, one instruction when we get to questions from people who are Zooming in, before you answer the question, please repeat it. Otherwise, the people who are Zooming in won't know what question you're addressing. So again, welcome, Greg. Thank you, Sai. Um, thank you all for coming this afternoon for this uh, for this panel. I'm excited to have um, three out of four of our panelists here. <laughs> the one who I believe is on. Uh, she'll be on her way. She'll be on her way, and we'll we'll kind of slowly roll into this a little bit here. But um, we have four panelists with whose work in different ways impacts upon uh, commercial real estate. Uh, downtown planning and have been you know thinking about uh, you know what's happening in Portland and in other places uh, with respect to this I think really substantial question about you know what what does it mean for downtowns uh, to re, you know to maintain their function and you know at least historic function as commercial centers how does that evolve how should that evolve in the context of a Kind of post-COVID um, uh, economy and society. And so, I will introduce each of the four panelists uh, and give them a chance to introduce themselves and a little bit of what they do and how that impacts uh, upon this larger question, uh, which was really the the framing goal from the 1972 downtown plan, which was quote to strengthen downtown's role as an important center for administrative, financial, personal, and professional business service and governmental activities. Um, so my questions, I will have, I'll have four questions after that for the panel and then uh, time permitting we'll have time for a question and answer from there. So I will start uh, to my uh, immediate right with uh, Jill Sherman, uh, co-founder of Evelyn and Company. So. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. So I'll just give you a uh, tiny bit of introduction of kind of who I am and what I do and then how some of the work and things I'm involved with right now are intersecting with the questions um, that we're going to be talking about today or the topic. So uh, Gert, uh, Edlin & Co. is one of two successor companies to what was Gerding Edlin, which is a real estate developer that was headquartered here in Portland, working both no, uh, locally and nationally, primarily focused on urban mixed use sustainable development. Um, Edlin and Co is, as I said, one of two successor companies. We're focused on affordable housing, middle income housing, <clears throat> public private partnerships, and then projects that push the boundaries of sustainability. Work that I was doing at Edlin and I'm now uh, still doing at Edlin and Company. 
And I would say, you know, we just finished an office building um, last September that we actually started construction in the pandemic at the very beginning is when we closed. And I'm just incredibly relieved that we had anchor tenants, you know, and we had that pre pretty much 80% pre-leased and that's where we sit today. That's where my office is. It's an old town. I come into that office three days a week. So I'm pretty familiar with what the current condition is. Um, and then the other thing is I'm involved in the OMSU master plan as the master developer. So that's kind of a large redevelopment opportunity in also what's considered a central city location, though not traditional um, CBD. And we're wrangling with the master planning of that, what the mix of uses should be. And, you know, really rethinking or wondering, you know, that million square feet of commercial office that it was originally in that, uh, you know, proposed master plan. Uh, should we be looking at whether we can do more? There was already quite a bit of residential, but should we be even doing more residential if, of course, Troy will let me? So, you know, that's to be determined. But uh, Whoa, those are some of the ways that uh, I'm intersecting, you know, just in my daily work with some of the issues we're going to talk about here. And Jill is one of two Tawana School alums oh, yeah. on this panel. So, yeah. um, Troy? So I'm Troy Doss. I'm with the uh, Portland Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. I'm a uh, lead the central city planning team. Um, been with the city for about 23 years. And most of my work involves uh, creating plans for the central city um, and then helping implement them over the years. And like, for instance, as Joe mentioned, I've been working with OMSI on the development of their master plan for almost a decade now. Things seem like it's been coming along for quite a while now. And then, um, and working with, you know, what's the right mix of uses there, giving the right zoning allowance to let them get to where they need to go. Um, I also can be working a bit on downtown recovery and working quite a bit still on the east side where there's the uh, Lloyd, Lloyd district, what's going to happen there in the future there, as well as the central east side where we've actually probably seen more of res or more office growth in the last several years than really the, the downtown area. So um, that's where my background is. Okay. I'm Lisa Boff. I apologize for being late. This is what community engagement in action looks like when you are on the phone with a community stakeholder. You do not get off, no matter what, especially if it's a moment to listen. Um, so I am also a graduate of the Master's in Urban and Regional Planning, and then I did a certificate in real estate. I originally worked with Troy back when at the Planning Bureau and then went over, and I now work for Prosper Portland, which is the city's economic development and redevelopment agency. My official title is Director of Development and Investment. So what sits on my side of the shop is a lot of the tax increment resources, kind of investment into community, investment into what we have um, increasingly called community action plans. And then we also have uh, property management, lending grants functions within that department. Happy to be here. Thank you for your um, being willing for me to step in late and join the group. And then last but not least, uh, my name is Julia Freibuti. I'm an associate professor of finance and real estate in the business school at PSU. And I guess I'm the odd one out. Um, so my background is in finance, real estate finance and investment, as well as, and this is professionally research and teaching wise, uh, corporate real estate management, which you may have never heard of before, but it actually focuses on the management of real estate and companies that are not real estate companies. And this touches on the question of the office users actually, because we cannot talk about the future of office without talking about well, where are companies heading with regards to how they design office, which regards to the HR policies, with regards to the war for talent and where they're positioning themselves. And so this is my background, um, part of my background, and uh, I'm hoping to contribute more from the business user side uh, to the discussion. So I have four questions that are kind of um, chronological, I guess, in terms of you know, looking backward and then looking forward. And so we'll maybe start with Professor Fariboti uh, and work back this way. Um, you know, looking back on the past 50 years, or at least, you know, the recent past, what do you think Portland has done well and less well with respect to downtown commercial development? Okay, so um, from my perspective, so just the business perspective without having any insights in all the particular policies. Um, one of the things that made Portland very appealing to office users, to companies, was that um, Portland itself, downtown and the east side, was attractive to talent. And so companies want to be where the talent is. 
if the talent wants to live in a central east side or in the Pearl or in Slab Town, companies want to relocate as close as possible to those places. And so the fact that Portland has created this environment where millennials and you know Gen Zers actually want to live in those type of environments um, has helped over the last 20 years attract companies back from suburban locations, to example, um, to the central east side. Um, you may know the company Autodesk. They relocated from, if I'm correct, Lake Oswego um, to um, just off Burnside on the east side. And I spoke to their real estate expert and they said, well, part of it we wanted to be close where our talent is because we do not want them to commute as long. And, you know, we, we are in a war for talent. And so um, Portland has created this environment where actually the talent wants to live, that companies want to hire. And that was the situation before COVID. And that is, I think, where Portland really um, succeeded compared to other cities that I'm familiar with. My turn. <laughs> Ooh, okay. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'll start with the well. So, and I also don't know that I would think about downtown when we talk about the Central East Side or the Lloyd District or downtown or Old Town. I think they're all really having their own experiences. So I think part of the challenge for me is kind of trying to think about it at a sub-district level versus a downtown is a one size fits all, right? Like the Pearl District's coming out of the pandemic in a really different way than Old Town is. And I think we need to honor that and acknowledge it. But so I'll put that out on the table first. I actually think we put forward really good planning around transit oriented development and we implemented on it well, right? I mean, I, if I look back over the past 50 years, there is a reason why Pioneer Place is where it is. There's a reason why smart parks are where they are. We were competing with suburban districts. We were pretty intentional about how we thought about planning and then we put financial tools in place to implement on it as a city. Um, I'm gonna, uh, the things I think we haven't done well is, and I think this is where we're really kind of learning and trying to lean in as a city currently is around social and racial equity. So I think we did not do well. We did well on bringing housing back into the central city. I don't know that we did as well thinking about affordable housing tools. And I don't know from a racial equity perspective that kind of downtown Portland feels approachable or affordable to everybody. And I think that's something we need to, as we look at the next 50 years, think about differently. Um, and some of that comes, I do think we got smarter about mix of uses over time, and some of that can come through both a mix of uses and mixed income of those uses, whether it's on the small business side or the, or the residential side. Okay. Um, <laughs> I would agree with everything that was just said. Okay. Um, I, would, I would say that, you know, kind of playing off the first comments, actually, is that I think that what we did in terms of mixed use for residential in areas was really probably a better catalyst for office development than a lot of things. Um, transit aside, um, because we found that those brought a lot of their amenities in terms of retail and other commercial services that served both communities pretty well. Um, and if you look at the look at the Pearl, you look at West End, you look at a couple areas where there was a Stephen South waterfront, where there was a greater mix of that, um, those areas did fairly well during the pandemic, uh, and they also didn't experience the same level of social ills that the downtown is, which is part of it is there really isn't much residential there. Um, and there's also a pretty high concentration of social services, and I'm going to go ahead and just put that out there that the concentration of social services, especially on the west side, as well as a fairly permissive attitude about camping for a period of time prior to the pandemic, I think is set us up to a spot where we weren't doing things particularly well and it's had an impact on attracting and maintaining. We actually attracted a lot of talent after the post-recession. We were pulling from Cruise Way and all these other areas. We've lost a tremendous amount of that as a result of the last couple of years and how we've managed things. So that's that's a pretty big impact. Yeah, let's see. I'm trying to think of what I could say in addition. I mean, I, I do think it's interesting because when you think of the what I think of as the traditional central business district, it it isn't a very mixed use, you know, district, right? It's primarily daytime uses office with a little bit of residential thrown in there, but but the other neighborhoods that folks have been talking about that have seemed to come back better, whether it's Slaptown or Central East Side or the Pearl, actually were developed when there was a big push, I think, to get housing downtown. And there were incentives associated with that and a bunch of housing got built downtown. And, and I feel like because 
everybody has been in their house, you know, probably more than they've wanted to be over the last few years, you know, those are still pretty lively. And now office maybe has moved in where office wasn't there originally. Um, and there weren't any incentives, I don't think, provided to those businesses necessarily either. They just have wanted to be there. Those are feeling very, like, pretty vibrant and good. Um, and that is different from the central business district and Old Town. And Old Town's a little different than the central business district in that I don't know, it doesn't have as much concentration of like larger office towers, right? It has primarily older historic buildings, but they started to see a lot of, you know, tech and creative firms who wanted that kind of feel of an old, cool, funky historic building moving into Old Town. And then we we're just on the cusp maybe of some res new residential market rate development there. And now that's, you know, kind of, kind of shut down. So in some ways it's not, and the social services, that's true. And, and there's a lot in that location, but when you have other people too, like people coming into their offices and people living there, then I feel like you can absorb the, the services in a way that still is, feels like a comfortable neighborhood for everybody to be in. I think it's the removal of people, you know, the larger amounts of people coming downtown for work that have created a situation in addition to the visible home houselessness challenge that has created a place where it doesn't feel that great in, in parts of downtown today. Can I also, I, I cause I wanna add, I gave you, I gave you the land use answer. <laughs> like, <laughs> and now I'm gonna give you the, this is the world I live in is give the land use, kind of the planner answer and then the, the kind of financial answer. I think there's also, I want to honor, we have really high tax rates in the city of Portland proper. So what, what Troy is mentioning is a lot of businesses are staying in the region, but they're actually moving out of Portland. So Multnomah County has seen the largest decrease in, in employment and is not and is recovering more slowly than the rest of Oregon. And that is a real impact to our small businesses, whether it's a business-based tax or an income-based tax. And I think that's just a reality of, I think sometimes we have to be more conscientious, and I say this as a city employee, of thinking about the policy moves we put in place and the financial, like the economic realities that they trigger and that they cost resources and that that needs to be like a more transparent conversation within our public sphere about we can certainly make go ahead and make those decisions, but we have to be intentional about what they're costing us, not just kind of direct financially, but in terms of who's having to pay it, and it may move them out to the suburbs, right? So if you look at it, most of the businesses who are leaving Portland aren't leaving the region, they're actually leaving Portland. And that means that what's happening is we're seeing a resuburbanization out to Beaverton, out to Cruise Way, and up into Vancouver of our smaller businesses, because the majority of our businesses are smaller businesses. It's actually interesting that you say that. Um, a while ago, I talked to an accounting firm and they had actually just, it was before the pandemic, and they had just decided to relocate from Multnomah County to Washington County. And they were like, we're saving $60,000 a year in taxes. We can hire another person. And that was part of their rationale. And so there, you know, there are even employment implications from that with new jobs. So yeah, absolutely. Big consideration for firms. So a number of you have touched on the issue of of the pandemic and how the pandemic has, you know, impacted firms, you know, uh, decisions about where to be and, and where to locate. To what extent would you characterize the pandemic as it's really changing the trajectory, you know, where downtown was in the years leading up to the pandemic, or or is it taking it in a very, you know, different, changing that uh, direction entirely, or just building upon or, or maybe accelerating some of those established trends that were already in place. Um, I, can, I can start with that. So there were some trends that were in place before the pandemic. So for example, for the last 10 years, companies were redesigning the offices to actually move away from an office where you go to work eight hours a day, you sit at your desk and do your job to this place that becomes a destination where you go to work, to meet, to interact. But you can also work from Starbucks or from home if you need to concentrate. And so as a result, Companies over the last 10 years have reimagined their office design with regards to how much space do we need for individual desks and how much space do we need for collaboration. And so actually over the last couple of years, companies have reduced the individual employee space in favor of 
a more participatory space. And so office design actually over the last 10 years has resulted in smaller offices without cramming people into small offices, but just because of the nature of how you move around the office during the day and how you're not just sitting on your desk and basically has resulted in companies needing less space. So that is a trend that we saw before the pandemic. Now, the pandemic has accelerated this trend because now we're adding also this remote work option. Um, and as, strong as, as long as we have a strong labor market, I don't see that changing. Um, as long as there is this war for talent, companies do have to cater to what their employees want. And so I feel like the remote work has been, ex has been accelerating this trend away from, you know, the office where you go to every day to like an office where you go to collaborate, to meet with people, which also has reduced the need for square footage by companies, which of course, from a company point of view is also fantastic because you can reduce your occupancy costs and your you know, cost for real estate. So win-win. Um, what I think the pandemic introduced was the shift from urban office to suburban. I think that definitely is pandemic induced um, be because before downtown Portland was an attractive location for companies to have their offices because folks wanted to live in the city. And so I think that is a new trend but the other trend has been before. So it's, I give you two answers. <laughs> I would agree with that. I mean, we were, we, the, the last time we were actually really focused on office development in the central city at all was the central east side. And that was to shift. There was a lot of desire for more creative services over there. Um, not your typical, you know, class A type office occupant, but creative services, digital tech. Um, and, we expanded the definition of what industry is to reflect these new industries so that they could have a house of home over there. And there was a lot of interest in rehabbing a lot of the old buildings there and creating some new buildings. And it's been pretty successful. And it was creating that that kind of workspace that we were just talking about. Um, and it was ironic because it started influencing development even on the uh, redevelopment on the, on the west side. We started seeing tenants in the big pink, for instance, ripping apart the ceilings and everything so that it would look like a creative office that they would find on the east side. Um, so it was an interesting phenomenon, um, but we we are finding that in that footprint you can use you can have a higher density of employment per square foot, so you don't need as much office space. For instance, you don't have to have these cubicles sitting there all day long that are being leased when they're not fully being occupied, especially now. So that's that's the big change we're starting to see. There's projections all over the place about where we're going. We'll see where it goes, but it's not looking great because people are going to cut back on the amount of office space they're using because of the the new work trends, um, at the very least. And then there is the overall condition of some of our downtown districts too. That is, unless those conditions start to improve, they're not going to be super attractive to future leasers. And just to be clear, we it's going to get worse before it gets better. I mean, I'm not trying to be too negative, but I'm just saying. <laughs> The people have signed long-term leases typically, right, for office space. So, you know, it could be five years, seven years, 10 years. So in terms of from the from the owner of the real estate, like you spoke from the company's perspective, but from the real estate owner perspective, you know, they that distress we haven't seen yet in a lot of cases because folks are locked in to longer term leases. And it also means that because there is so much space that's going to be available and already is available, we're not going to see as much demand to create new office space. So that's that's a for the city's perspective, that's a pretty big hit because there's a lot of fees and 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 money that comes generated by development in the review of development. So there's another kind of potential fiscal cliff that's coming ahead because of that issue facing the city. So I'm going to try and just build on because I don't know that I have much from like a real estate market angle. I do think there's another component, which is about how workers get to work. That has been a challenge for downtown that I would also hit on, given that like, which is transit was kind of a, a large share of how folks were getting into downtown with the pandemic. Folks stopped getting on transit and all of your suburban markets have free parking. And ultimately, most developers will tell you often kind of your ability to park somebody in a certain way or expectation either because they're paying for it and they're internalizing it into their lease rate or their employees are re re uh, ready to internalize it into their own da daily costs. I think you also have this impact of right now folks can stay at home or they can go to move to a suburban office market where they can park for free in a surface lot and that is not true about downtown and that's actually true across multiple uses but I would highlight it as particularly true for office. So 
<laughs> It'll get worse before it gets better. <laughs> sounds like uh, a good lead into my next question, yeah. which is about, you know, a lot has been made about the weak downtown recovery here in Portland relative to other cities. University of Toronto study put Portland, I think, third from the bottom out of like 48 possibly metros, uh, North American metros. Um, you know, how much of this is reality and how much is perception um, and or, or self-fulfilling? You know, uh, and how optimistic are you about the ability of Portland's downtown to bounce back in the next two to three years? Okay, I'm going to read you some stats because I thought it would be helpful to bring these. So we have Eco Northwest under contract. To be fair, they're not my statistics, so I should like. <laughs> like but we uh, put Eco Northwest under contract, and they've been doing an analysis of the central city by sub district to understand like what are short term trends versus long term, and then they're also doing it for our corridor citywide. There are 7 million square feet of vacant office space in the central city. So that's across all the sub-districts, central east side, downtown, old town. Um, during the pandemic, foot traffic in downtown, so I'm just gonna like, this is this is particular to the downtown sub-district is down 62%. Visitor foot traffic is down 42%. Downtown Seattle, which is a commensurate is the overall foot traffic is down 41% versus Portland's, which is down 62%. And, down, and Seattle's um, visitor foot traffic is down 14% versus 42%. And I, I, now this is debatable. I have to find there, like when the um, office market comes back, we had eco kind of map forward. When would somebody start building a speculative office building again in Portland? And that happens, assuming that happens at a 10% vacancy rate across the rest of your office inventory and the projected date for downtown now again the sub district of downtown is 2044. Mark your calendar. <laughs> now again it's all a model it's all dependent on a model right but I, I think it's safe to say you're not going to see something happen in the next two to three years. It is going to take much longer you may see Central East Side come back to what it was pre-pandemic but you're not going to see the downtown core come back. So the real question then is like, what do we do with the existing, <laughs> you know, down in the CBD, the, the neighborhoods that are the most challenged, those buildings that are going to become more empty as those leases, you know, um, how do they get reused in a way that contributes positively to downtown? You know, and, and I think there everybody was at first like housing, they're all going to be housing and um, you know, that's a little easy, easy. I'm like Debbie Downer. That's a little easier <laughs> said than done because a lot of the blocks are very big. So you have very deep units or very big units. You know, um, it can be very expensive. We've looked at a few like every developer in the city right now, very expensive to do the seismic upgrades that are required. So it, there are going to be some that I think will be good candidates for uh, redeveloping as residential. And I think, uh, you know, the city has a role to play probably uh, from a policy and financial perspective probably to, to make those happen but we're going to need to figure out some other uses as well for those for those buildings to you know enliven downtown and then the perception versus reality I think it's kind of both it's like yes there are things that aren't going as well as maybe they could be but on the other hand I, I kind of feel like we were such a darling for so long you know <laughs> it's always in the New York Times about how great it, Portland was it's like I feel like some people are like loving to hate us kind of now, you know, um, and and so I I am, you know, we're committed to this city. And and I think, again, it's maybe not about where the, all the business is going to come back, though I would like to see people coming into the office more regularly. And I, I understand that there's a balance because it's a competitive labor market, but I feel like if you could make people come back a little bit, but they had a good experience because there were colleagues who were in the office and there was interaction and maybe you gave them a free sandwich for lunch and they walked outside and there was something interesting to look at or listen to so then the next time maybe you weren't making them come as as much I do feel like that's really important I don't think we can just give up and say like okay we're all gonna you know come into the office once once a month and that I, I think that is not the right solution and, and I think there is an opportunity, and I'm an optimist. Um, <laughs> so despite it all, um, firstly, there's an opportunity for affordable office space for young companies, for new companies that may not be able to sign a three, five, seven year lease 
Um, and so there's an opportunity maybe for finding new innovative ways of providing affordable office space to young companies, um, maybe an extension of co-working. Um, there's also um, this opportunity to maybe rethink, and I know it's, it's pricey, but maybe rethink as well downtown as an extension of PSU. Um, somebody actually had that idea this morning. Um, we have a lot of hotels that are empty. And how many of you are PSU students that are here in the room? How many of you live in downtown? And part of it is out of affordability. Um, I live in downtown too, so so I, I those of you that live in downtown, I know I know how to still live downtown. And so maybe there's also this opportunity to rethink downtown away from the traditional office users more towards, well, what if we house more students from PSU in downtown and find a way to provide affordable housing for them, which also then brings actually this talent pool to companies, which maybe in the future attracts bigger companies back to downtown. And of course, um, office is so closely tied to the affordability of housing that that in general also is a big aspect of how do we revive uh, downtown well, it comes back to who can live here, who wants to live here, and this affordability angle is a big aspect of it. But um, I think there are opportunities. It may just be, I mean, you just have to be a little bit creative. And right now, just to give you an idea from the investor side, uh, nobody's buying office in Portland. I mean, office is bad countrywide, but nobody's touching office. I was talking to office brokers the other day, and they're like, yeah, there's no asset market. Like we're renting offices and there are companies that are actually still moving to Portland, um, retail and office, but investors are just not buying. So there's no cap capital coming in, which of course then affects also development. Um, so I guess we have to think about what do we do with the office that we have um, and how can we get creative and create opportunities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe you wanna go? Well, I would just, I was going to say yes to all those things. And I, one of the things we're going to be looking at is, is how to incent more residential development downtown, whether it's office conversions or not. Um, the, the, there was some interesting articles written by Richard Florida last year or so, or two years ago, I guess, now when this all started, it, it, pronouncing that the, the life of central business districts are dead. It's over. You can't have standalone office districts and expect success anymore. I think that we're proving that um, to some extent. And so we're going to be looking at, there's a lot of properties that are, regardless of whether we convert them or not, there's some fairly underutilized and low density development still in the downtown core that could be re repurposed, redeveloped into something else. So we're going to want to figure out how we can start to kind of get the same magic that we got in other districts by leading with housing, quite honestly. We've never been intentional about office. We've always just kind of said it, it'll pop up where the market wants it and when it wants it. And we've just created the zoning that allows that to happen. Um, we were far more intentional about residential, and then we would see economic growth as a result of that move. So that's probably what we're going to have to try again in the downtown core, um, and maybe even in other districts that are you know, a little more available, like Lloyd. Lloyd is, the Lloyd, <laughs> the current policy direction for the Lloyd, which is only four years old, um, is a continuation of what was been on the book since about 1990, and it's a retail and office district. Well, that's not going to happen. It's going to be a residential mixed-use district if it's anything, and it's the only way it's going to go climb out of where it's at is to have more residential. So some of the more re recent redevelopment efforts there that are talking about redeveloping the mall, uh, what's happening around the Rose Quarter and the, and the freeway project, uh, residential, residential, residential. Um, and I would agree with that's where we're going to have to go. And I think another property type that's so closely linked to office is retail. So when you hear retail and office brokers talk to each other, they're like, you know, they, they sing the same song. It's as bad. Um, and it's a so, sad song. yeah, it's a, it's a very <laughs> sad song. <laughs> um, and so that is, of course, something that needs to be added to this discussion. I mean, we're talking about mixed use, um, but of course, retail is important to bring people back to the office and want, make people want to live in you know downtown. But on the other hand, they also only thrive if people, it's like a chicken and egg problem. Um, they're so dependent on office and, and apartment um, that um, they need to be added to the discussion, but it's, it's a little bit tricky with retail as well. So retail is another property type that um, I think needs a lot of attention in downtown. And again, a solution may be to, you know, have pop-up stores to open, have like innovative store designs for local companies, minority owned, you know, innovative companies to showcase their products. And so I think this is where a lot of creativity is required. It is possible. And that's actually what, like, are the office building that I referred to, our retail is empty and we're going to, you know, bring it up to like enough of a warm shell that we can do pop-ups for that we just to try to get some activation yeah. you know on that ground floor or even make us spaces yeah yeah 
Um, so I'm just going to add, because I, I think there's, there's, I think as we talk about it with City Hall, there's like a near term and a long term. I think we're, we're acknowledging that a conversion play of office to residential is kind of a long term play, probably infill just based on development and construction cycles of new housing is a long term play. I do think there's a really interesting opportunity around um, kind of act, what I would call activation. So I just listed those visitor numbers. It's super interesting. So we had, we actually tracked Old Town's. Old Town has what, what is called a district manager. So we operate these areas that are called neighborhood prosperity network areas, largely on the east side. But Old Town was really interested in the model. And so we supported them hiring a district manager. That district manager actually activated Davis Street between 3rd and 4th Avenue in partnership with the adjacent businesses. You can literally see the blip on kind of visitor pedestrian traffic in Old Town on the days that events are happening, that people are coming back to downtown to go to. My other joke is, it's also really interesting. You can see the blip for Lloyd District was also really impacted. During Comic-Con, Lloyd District went off the charts in terms of people coming back into downtown. So giving people a reason to come into downtown for something that you can't get on your corridors, right? Like you can't get down the street from your house, whether that's tied to PSU as an institution or performance venues or like the unique neighborhoods that we have in downtown, I think is a key near-term opportunity. Well, there's a, there was a piece on Marketplace this morning on NPR about um, how the current owners of the Lloyd Mall are actually doing that. They're doing some pop-up stuff. They're doing <laughs> they did a roller skating event there. They've done some film oh. events there and they're making space available because they have a lot of space available for, for startup or startup retail. So um, that's one way to kind of get going. And they're seeing a pretty big response to that, whereas that place was dead uh, in the past. It's it has more life again. So it's interesting. And of course, that also opens up the question about traffic in downtown and mm -hmm. like, like, because I would assume some of those events actually closed down streets, right, and mm -hmm. made it pedestrian mm -hmm. only. So um, maybe that's part of the whole revitalization of downtown or like they're bringing it back, rethinking how much traffic, what direction, like pedestrian versus car. I don't know if there are the discussions going on. about. Oh, there's that. a lot of discussions about oh. that. Um, well, I mean, it's another thing is just how you efficiently use the land base of the, of the central city, because, you know, I'm sure you all know this, but it's, you know, it's, it's gridded with a 200 by 200 block pattern, but it, it results in 48% of the land mass being dedicated to right of way. So um, there are probably areas where we could do major road diets where we don't need all of that to go through and then when we have done these kind of closed off uh, special events or even during the pandemic when we had you know retail coming out into the street it's pretty successful and people liked it mm -hmm. so bring on the planners <laughs> <laughs> Um, Lana, so funny thing is we oh, it's not oh, as if it's not as if we didn't talk about trying to do those things for decades and it was the pandemic that actually made it happen all of a sudden it was like oh I guess we could do this which is ironic because it was the same thing with working from home because a lot of employers would not were not open to their employees working at home thought productivity would go off the cliff turns out it's worked although I would go back to one thing that Jill kind of mentioned too is it, it there's value in having people back in a workplace. I mean, we we did our whole plan based on the central city being a center for you know innovation and communication and, and you know the synergies that you build off of being around each other and being around uh, institutions that are here. When everyone's working in the suburbs and not coming downtown, that that falls off a cliff. And when we when even our own office, it seems far more productive on the days that everyone's in the same room than when they're trying to communicate via a, a Zoom call. And I think that's. I think there's going to be some people who are going to start to hunger to be around people again and not always be at home and communicating via Zoom. Can I also make, I'm going to use this as a pitch for community-based organizations. So no matter, we built Flanders Street because it was called for in plans as a festival street. It literally had never been programmed, ever. And the tremendous difference, so it closed down during the pandemic. And the reason it was programmed is because there was somebody in community working with businesses to actually actively program it. And so I think there's a really important role, particularly for kind of economic development or business oriented community-based organizations to work with the adjacent businesses to actually program it because it's their space, right? Like ultimately it's, we can plan for it, we can permit it, we can fund it, but it's not the city's space ultimately, or it won't come alive if it's seen as the city's space versus it's seen as the community space. And so I do think there's a really important 
role that we can't miss out on and we don't do a great job of what we would call capacitating it or funding it in the city because it's really challenging to kind of find resources there's not a logical resource to support those kind of organizations any anything more on the kind of near-term adaptation strategies if not then i i want to hear a little bit over the horizon you know for i mean this is looking back on 50 years of a of a plan you know that that guided a number of significant you know investments and, and long-range plans you know what looking ahead what are the kinds of investments, plans, strategies that are going to be really essential for, for keeping Portland you know, vital as a commercial center, not in the way that it was you know, five years ago or even 25 years ago, but in a, in a different way? What, is that, what, what does that need to look like? I think my answer is probably for, for a business person the most surprising, but also the one that makes the most sense, affordable housing. Um, because obviously, whether it's downtown or Portland in general, the ability of attract folks that can actually afford an apartment or you know a single family home here has a big impact on the attractiveness of Portland to companies. And for example, I don't know if you know, but Tillamook actually moved to Portland. Um, they moved their headquarters from Tillamook to Portland, which caused a big stir in Tillamook. Um, but part of the reason was is they had such an issue attracting talent in Tillamook because there is hardly any rental housing. There's, you know, you can't afford a home. I was shocked at home prices and how little there is available in Tillamook. And so they moved to Portland in order to get the talent that they need. And now Portland, of course, has an affordability issue as well. And so um, for companies beside our outstanding universities here, um, the other important factor is affordable housing, obviously taxation and you know, incentives play into it as well. But I would say the one thing, affordable housing or middle income housing. Like I, I know they're, they're, I'm sorry, business person, like the terms, the, the even a you know, junior programmer may not be able to afford uh, an apartment in downtown. So the middle, middle income and affordable housing. Was it a planner answer? <laughs> I agree. Oh, oh and, I, and, I, and, I, and, and a greater diversity of housing. We've done housing studies in the past, leading up to the last plan we did. They're the missing middles, huge, yeah. and uh, family compatible housing is a huge issue as well, because most of the housing stock is one bedroom and studio apartments, which is a poor way to try to accommodate a greater diversity of, of, of tenants. Yeah. yeah, it's just... Yeah. yeah, I mean, middle income housing is such a hard nut to crack because there's no, you know, resource, like when we talk about affordable, mm -hmm. usually people are talking about publicly subsidized out or below 60% of area median income. There are a whole bunch, you know, of tools, not enough to meet the demand, but there are a set of tools out there, federal, you know, federally, state and locally, whereas there really are not any tools at all for middle income housing, yet you can't get a rate of return to attract investment. So it's very difficult. To, to figure and the out. issues there are really, I mean, if you think about it, it's across the board, it's land. Land is just ridiculously expensive, deals don't cancel. And with middle income housing, they actually, once they're built, they pencil relatively well because you have a low vacancy, there's a high demand. But the development costs are so high that the deal overall just doesn't make sense. And I mean, it comes back to land costs. And I guess that's that's a planner question. It comes back to financing costs, especially now that interest rates have gone up. Labor, it's really hard competing for the pool of labor that you have with regards to construction, obviously materials. And then planner answer permitting as well. And, you know, building processes and the different you know design reviews and all of the fun stuff. Um, and so it's basically all for five inputs for developers that make it really expensive. And so that is definitely a challenge that we have to face, especially with regards to middle market rate middle. Income. Yeah, that's a good point because we have been acquiring existing middle income, you know, units that we can keep as middle income and then an attract investor because again, we're not taking on construction risk. It's already occupied, already is cash flow, you know, so that is a little bit easier, but we won't. That's more of a defense strategy, preventing those existing units from somebody buying them and trying to make them, you know, 
B plus or A minus properties to increase the rents and lose, you know, but we actually need to come up with a way to create more of them, which does mean we have to somehow get over those development cost hurdles that you ran through. And that's where Lisa comes in. From <laughs> there. That's funny. I was going to, I was going to give a couple, I was going to give a very planner answer. I am curious about, right. So Portland is where Portland is because our economy was long natural resource based and people were bringing natural resources into the city, sticking them on a train or on a boat to go someplace. I, I am curious, right? Like we, we were joking about this this morning, but I don't know how much it's, it's a joke. Does Portland start to become a bedroom community to suburban office and industrial uses because it's actually cheaper to build in outer areas? Like if you look at our, our industrial base right now, and largely our economic base has mo is moving to Hillsboro. And I think that has to be something, I guess I'm going to particularly excited, but I'm curious about what we do with our land use laws within the state of Oregon to start to, we put them in place back in the 70s and what still resonates today and what changes, right? We, I work for the Urban Renewal Agency and we, had to, we have had to go through like some serious self-searching about what we did back in the 60s and 70s and how we do, how we use tools today to do almost the flip opposite and stabilize community versus destabilize community. And I think it's an interesting time from a land use perspective, if our economy is changing, does land use need to change to reflect those economic realities? So I will, there you go. <laughs> that's just a few programs. Yeah. Well, that's a pretty good <laughs> the wheelbarrow there. It's interesting to hear that too, because there was this editorial in the paper the other day, which made me cringe a little bit about is it time to expand the UGB again? And I think this the question here is: is it do you manage all the jurisdictions within the within the UGB as one, as opposed to twenty different? entities that are all supposed to supply, supply the same amount of land base. You know, you've got a 20 year supply of this, of this, of this, of this. If you look at it more collectively, would that, would that ease some of that pressure? Would we allow you to focus some more in one area, one geography, and more in others? That's an interesting proposition. Maybe Portland will become a little bit more like, you know, a place where you have downtown Portland as this employment center where people also live, but then you also have Hillsboro, Beaverton, Crusher. And so it becomes more this like multiple, multiple nuclei, I think that's like planners now, there is a term for it. Um, and that's perfectly fine because then, you know, you have these multiple centers and people have to drive less, which have, has an impact obviously on the environment um, with climate risk becoming an issue, with equity issue, uh, equity becoming an issue with, as people get priced out. So maybe that's just where Portland is going to go. And it's okay. But does that involve just rethinking on a very fundamental level what the role is of downtown, you know, as, I mean, mm -hmm. the kind of 1972 framework of like downtown as a central business districts, you know, is that, is that out the window at this point? Do we need a different paradigm entirely for thinking about the role of downtowns, you know, as in a functional sense within a larger urban regional context. And then I think that's a lot of the talk about housing. You know, we need to think more about housing in downtowns rather than office. Think about relationship to industrial nodes, you know, and, and spaces in, in more peripheral areas. Do we just need a different way of talking about? It? Yes. <laughs> yeah, I think it's I, I think like it's super having just come from Seattle. Seattle's downtown is largely a campus. Right. I mean, like the majority of Denver, it's like the Amazon, it's, it's the Amazon campus, and it's super interesting, right? Like, if you look at it's an interesting question, totally. Like, 40% I, of their office is, is Amazon. I, I do think we have to look at the economic underpinnings of like where is our economy growing, right? Because ultimately, development just chases economic growth, right? I mean, it chases demand. So it's going to chase where people want to live, or it's going to chase where people want to work <laughs> or like hold their businesses. And I think there's an interesting question to ask why, where do businesses? and residents want to be? And then what is unique about kind of the downtown proposition that's different than being in Beaverton or it's different than being even in East Portland? Because I do think there's interesting opportunities. It also opens up for East Portland. Well, even the the, the town centers and corridors and the, even inside the city of Portland have done better than downtown in the pandemic because now if you're working at home or or be open an office near your home there, those retail services are great. You're still close to all the amenities you like. I mean, there's something about that complete mm -hmm. kind of community, for lack of a better phrase, 
that's missing in the CBD. Um, that's why the pearl has done okay. I think that's, I think it's why the, it'll take a little bit longer for the centrally side to come along, but it will. And I think when they start redeveloping the Lloyd, you're going to see that type of development pattern. You're not going to see a standalone one or the other. It just doesn't work that way. So maybe Craig, you're right. Downtown Portland is like in an identity crisis and need to figure out what makes it different from downtown Beaverton, downtown Hillsborough, down, because I mean, those places have been developing their own downtowns and that increases their appeal to employers and, you know, residents. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's like just to figure out what is special about downtown Portland that attracts residents and companies and, and deal with some of the other issues, but. Can I do a pitch for the river? <laughs> when they were doing the central city plan, I always told them I really wanted a full section just on like what's distinct about the, no no place else has a river, right? Like if you look at a Beaverton downtown does not have a river. Lake Oswego downtown. There's Vancouver a lake. has a river up here. Vancouver has a river and they're tapping into it. They're, they're, joking. Joking. <laughs> <laughs> they're really embracing it as the identity of how they grow. And coming back to office, I actually make my students do that in class. Uh, office rents in the flood zone, which is usually by the river, um, uh, rent at a, at a premium. So there is value to mm -hmm. occupiers. Um, and so, yeah, you're right. Maybe the river is like, and then, and, the, and then of course the parks. So mm -hmm. maybe that's what makes downtown special. Mm -hmm. I, I think in Vancouver, having worked there in the private sector before I came here, which is a long time ago, um, that's when they started thinking about the riverfront, but it was partly it was more of an economic and mixed use kind of proposition as opposed to an environmental proposition, which is kind of how we lead it here. And so I think that's had a real impact on what we get in return. I mean, but I do think also people who move here have moved here. A lot of it is about access to the, to the outdoor. You know, it's it's about things that are close to whether you're in Portland or the suburbs that you have access to that are important to people and maybe the brand of, you know, being a, a more sustainable or a city that was, you know, think a little ahead of the curve on green building, which I think that generation, you know, really cared about. And so maybe, you know, now, so that was, you know, whatever, 10 or 20 years ago, now maybe it's about more about social equity, you know, and, and so if we could become a you know, leader or develop some programs, and this gets to like maybe creatively using spaces for mm -hmm. small minority owned businesses that are affordable or affordable housing or truly middle income affordable, you know, the whole spectrum, you know, so that we keep it because we're still going to have the beautiful beach and the beautiful mountains, you know, so which I think will, as long as traffic isn't too bad to get out there, you know, continue and food's been important mm -hmm. too, you know, and the restaurants and supporting those businesses. Um, so maybe if we could like take what we're maybe where we were known sort of in being on cutting edge environmentally into moving it more forward into more social equity, you know, maybe there's an opportunity there for downtown. I'm gonna I'm gonna use my moderator privilege here to ask one more question before we open it up to the to the audience here. And it, and it's a few of you have, have alluded to this, but just the role of PSU in this mm -hmm. equation. You know, PSU is an anchor institution, a you know a commercial user. I guess we're a, a governmental activity, but we are you know a service business. Turns out, um, how how should le the PSU leadership be thinking about the the role of you know the university and its you know the potential for contributing in the kind of short run and longer run to, to some of these uh possibilities so i can talk a little bit to that and, and partly because i'm uh i'm cheating a little bit because i heard the provost talk about it this morning um <laughs> but the easiest answer short term would be to make students come back to campus and not because you're forcing them because of in-person courses but create something on campus that makes them want to come you have the same issue in office and retail you want to create a place attract people to a shopping center or to an office it's the same with PSU why would students want to come here well maybe because of events on campus maybe because of career services maybe because of events such as this and so I think we as a university have to be a little bit more creative than how we had used to be in the past um where we just said come to class in person and that's it and then 25,000 people would come to you know campus because they worked and, and studied here um but so that would be a short-term one create something that attracts folks to be on campus 
Um, and then interestingly, the provost mentioned something is and that is that when you're in downtown, you don't even realize how many buildings belong to PSU um, because there are no labels everywhere. But like, I mean, we have a lot of properties. You would be shocked. We have a real estate department here at PSU. We are landlords, we're developers, we're occupiers, we have office, we have retail, we have housing. Um, and of course, student housing is a big aspect as well of, of what PSU is. And so just making people realize like how many buildings belong to PSU and how big the PSU campus is and maybe expanding it even. Um, interestingly, so I did my PhD at Georgia State in Atlanta. And I think Atlanta, um, the downtown area now is like completely taken over by Georgia State. They bought um, hotels that they turned into student housing. They expanded their lecture halls. It's, and, and maybe that's something that, you know, we will do as well, where PSU eventually grows more into downtown and um, becomes like even more of an urban university than what we already are and also showcases how important we are to downtown um, because we put our name on every building or um, talk to the city more and interact more with the city on, you know, joint programs. Um, so I think PSU plays a very important role in activating downtown, um, helping downtown get out of this crisis. And of course, you know, it's a, it's a two-way relationship between those two. So I think there are a lot of opportunities. Okay, I'll answer. Uh, I'll let, I, I think, I'm gonna try and put this. So I think there's two things. We've worked on a lot of real estate deals with Portland State. It sits within a TIF district. We've done a lot of work, particularly around the ground floor. And I wanna honor the fact that it's both kind of hamstrung in doing this, but I also think there's a lacking kind of university place for people to come to as students. Like I felt it as a student, right? I mean, probably this, the, this center is the closest it comes to really having like a place that people can go and hang out in. And as I think about it from small businesses and it's really the way that PSU finances its projects makes tenanting the ground floor for small businesses super challenging. And for any number of reasons, but it's largely because their construction costs tend to build like institutions, which means they are not cheap, which means it's not only kind of new construction costs in terms of leasing to retailers and the state expects a certain amount of um, match to come in. And there's very rarely a match that PSU can come up with that covers the retail space. It has to do with how they financially structure their, their product. But I really think it's to the detriment of the, the um, university's experience of place. Like you don't experience place in PSU where you really feel like, oh, that business is a local retailer. Like the PSU real estate department doesn't have the flexibility to lease to some of our small businesses that I think they would ideally like to lease to. So I think that's, um, I think that's a really important component. I also think PSU has just been, a, a, I would say there was a point in time where PSU was really in expansion mode from a real estate perspective. And I almost feel like they went, um, um, they went past kind of the, I don't know, they went past where they were comfortable. And so we've really seen them kind of entrench back into much more like focused on academic space relative to focused on mixed use urban, like building urban form and being part of urban form. And I don't know, you guys would have a better sense of why that's happening, but it used to be they would be, they were much more open to the idea of having mixed use buildings where PSU had a presence, but wasn't right. I mean, Gertie Elon built one of the first ones of those where PSU had a presence, but wasn't a hundred percent of what was happening in that building. We were in that building. You were in that building. Yeah, I would agree with those. I think the branding thing is an interesting idea because when you're in Eugene, there's uh, no missing where U of O has a uh, facility. Um, I mean, anywhere. That's crazy. Um, and I think that's important because there's so much of the workforce that's in downtown that actually are graduates of PSU. It's a, it's a pretty high number. So it's be good to you know, celebrate that in some way. I think using some of your assets too. I mean, I, I've been here 23 years, I've seen at least two master plans produced by the university that haven't really moved forward very much, or it goes through a very long planning process and then president changes and then the plans change. Um, and I think there's been some really interesting moves like purchasing a university place, for instance, it's a station, it could be a really amazing stationary development that could have a sense of place as much as the urban center does here. Um, go for it, <laughs> do that. We set you up for the entitlements to do it, use them. That's that's kind of where I would go from. And I think a lot of that would be housing because one of the earlier ideas when that was brought into uh, the university and it was brought into the North Academy Urban Renewal Area, which was an interesting trick. Um, the promise of that was that it would be housing for graduate students, students with families and staff. 
And what a wonderful idea that would be. So I think that's another thing to lead by example in some ways. Yeah, I think that, I mean, uh, the biggest role to play, I think, is the, you know, getting people back downtown, which I think is really critical. And then, of course, just the ongoing role that the university has in, you know, educating former, you know, future employees, um, helping to incubate kind of new business and support entrepreneurs. Um, a big, the university obviously plays a big role on, you know, on the social equity front in mm -hmm. terms of who, what the student body looks like and who, you know, has the opportunity to be part of PSU, which is really important. Um, and then, you know, activating, I think, thinking maybe rethinking some of the ground floor uses, you know, to be a little more dynamic. So we have about half an hour, um, and I just want to make sure that there is plenty of time for questions. So are there questions either in the room or on on the Zooms? No. I shut down. <laughs> <laughs> so I live downtown in Harrison Tower Apartments. There's two new residential buildings being built on Fifth Avenue on Hall and Harrison. There's two low-income developments right below me, and there's a proposed 30 story complex in Delphine River Place with all these empty elements of it. That's a huge mismatch. And it sounds bizarre to me that it's cheaper to build brand new stuff than to take an office building and gut it and start it over. I just I don't have to comprehend that at all. Well, repeat the question. Oh, yes. The question <laughs> is um, there, there is some residential development happening already, um, downtown, both affordable and market rate, but yet there's all these empty office buildings. So it seems like we're missing something. You know, why are we building new residential buildings instead of converting office? And, you know, it seems hard to believe that it would actually be more expensive to build, um, to re renovate than to build ground up. And the, the maybe overly simple answer is that it actually can be more expensive <laughs> to renovate an existing office building to be residential than it is to build ground up. It can actually be sig significantly more expensive. And I think that's the challenge. The other thing is some of those office buildings haven't yet gotten to the point where they're gonna transact, i.e. sell in a way that, you know, at a low enough basis that cost per square foot that starts to maybe help to bridge those gaps a little bit. The back. The one of the challenges I met that what I had that was not in Sunday's house, the two Sundays I think are the Mr. Amenity in downtown. Because I was so sad that being really quiet, you know, in that game, but it is might be pretty not easy, but the only occasion that I talk to fully down that in only is about I mean writing a dissertation or like a purpose like what's the purpose of it. I mean it was really quiet, but then I think it's getting really alive by the Tuesday. Because like the yesterday I went I went to the theater in downtown to watch some maybe my kids and then <laughs> So I think that all the contract communities is really the goal that was not making it. Yeah, so the, so the comment in the room mm -hmm. here was about the role of arts and cultural amenities as, as being a, something that, you know, exists in downtown to, to bring people, to bring people back. Well, I have a thought or two on that. Um, yes, I agree with that. Mm -hmm. Although I would say that some of our some of our anchors are not in the best of shape. So the Keller is in poor shape and needs to be redone or relocated somewhere in, in the city because um, it has significant seismic issues. And um, we're not we're not unique anymore in having all of these amenities either. So it's interesting, I had dinner with a few architects and urban designers not that long ago, and they were talking about how often they go over to Beaverton and go to their cultural center there 
in downtown, the old downtown in Beaverton has a lot of great anchor restaurants now, the same restaurants that you would find in Mississippi or on Alberta or on 23rd. So there, we're not special anymore. And, and the amenities that we have downtown are starting to pop up in other locales around the region. Vancouver's right on our heels on that. So we're gonna need to do better. I, I'm just going to build on that because I think it's an important one. It gets it's a it's similar to the conversion. So we actually lose out on certain act like acts or performers coming into Portland because the age of our asset, like the, what we would call the age of our assets, like the performing centers are so old that they, they don't actually satisfy the drop off load, like load in, load out requirements of the performers. And so they skip over the Portland market. And it's why sometimes they'll put we don't have good mid-size, we would call it mid-size venues, so not like the arena <laughs> or the smaller, like, you know, the place you go to see a local band, but a mid-size, we don't have a good mid-size arena that's new. So a lot of acts actually skip the Portland market. And I think there are folks who are recognizing that and kind of drawing away from it, right? If you look at it, Ben just put in a new performance center and a, there's all sorts of politics totally that sit behind that because a lot of the folks who run those mid-size arenas are also national entities versus local entities. And I think there's kind of any number of economic development conversations behind it. I, the answer is yes. And to get to Troy's, I think you can't let the asset just become something that nobody, want, the performers don't want to use or it's not useful for them because then they'll just stop coming to this market. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think Portland Art Museum has done amazing, an amazing job at really thinking through what their future looks like into the next generation. Like, I think they're a great example of a cultural organization that has really thought through their expansion and how they open it up and build into the community versus feeling closed box. I don't know. If, do you know they're building a box in between their two facilities? Okay, sorry. So they're building it, they're, they're actually connecting their two buildings, and then they're going to make it permeable so you can actually get in and out from the street, which is great, because right now it reads like a, like a brick wall. <laughs> we have a question, number three. Oh. Do you want to call on Emily Fallon? Okay. All right. Uh, what is your question, Emily? Hi. Uh, yeah, I had a question um, specifically regarding parking. I work for OHSU and before the pandemic, um, a lot of our office space was actually being eliminated because of how expensive parking was um, per day. I think it was about $17 a day and also the office space itself was expensive. Um, however, at, once the pandemic hit, we then um, all transitioned to working from home and now we have the option of either returning or not returning. And because of the parking prices per day, um, I have realized how much money I've saved. Um, and so I'm just wondering, I know like with land use specifically, I know that widening things would not maybe make sense, but what about making more um, garages that go upward um, what would be is would that be a solution or would there be another solution on how expensive parking is currently um i'll start and i'd be curious what jill thinks um parking is expensive and we so in the central city the, the most recent plan that was adopted four years ago has a prohibition on new surface parking. So we don't want to see buildings demo just to create more surface parking. And then on top of that, we put minimum density requirements on these lots that we will incent denser development. But when you build structured parking, it's really expensive and it takes a very long time to get your money back out of that investment as compared to other uses. Um, so you need to really have it in a location that's going to have a couple shifts turning over throughout the week. Can't just be just for office. Um, or can't just be for evening activity. Otherwise, it's going to take decades and decades for it to, to pencil out for anybody. So we're not likely to see a lot of that. And we do have a lot of it right now. I think it's probably as available right now as uh, a lot of office spaces are. Um, but I don't know that there's a big incentive to lower the, the lease rate per day on those because they do have debt service they're trying to pay off on those things. Like I'm close to hitting that right? <laughs> you sound like a developer. <laughs> People say that all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, parking, 
you know, is such a challenge for any development that drives development. Every project you start, it's like, how are we going to park it? Um, we, we've run into the issue with Central City, you know, and, oh, we need just to be able to have a few more parking spaces as part of this, and we, but we can't build surface parking and we can't afford to build structure you know, structured parking. And, and the, I mean, parking gets built in development because the rent for the apartment or the office space is subsidizing the parking. The, even though I, I understand that it's expensive what, you're, what people are paying, it still doesn't actually um, provide, you know, it's typically a significant enough return on an investment that somebody would just build a parking garage, which is why if you look for the most part, for structured parking garages, a lot of them have been built either to support a commercial use or by the city, by the public sector. Any question over here? Yes, and let me kind of uh, go to the down piece, which is, uh, and for me, what really makes Portland so enjoyable, especially in contrast to like Houston and Hills Road, is the ability to travel without the car. Mm -hmm. So, do you guys think? The ability to focus on that and putting like closed down more streets and being able to go around the community via non car travel is probably Portland's strongest and most forward on top of more housing. So, the question here in, in the room was about the flip side of the question about parking in a way, which is about the advantage of downtown in enabling car free you know, transportation. I actually think that's a great opportunity. So I'm a walker myself. If I can avoid driving, I avoid it at any cost. That's why I live so close to campus. I have at least two graduate students that want to live in walking distance to their jobs. And that's why they live in downtown. And I see a couple of heads nodding. And so um, maybe that's one of the unique selling points of, of downtown and should be more leaned into closing off streets or maybe creating, if parking at all, like finding ways to um, you know, use more of the parkings outside of the downtown area and then, then make the downtown area more walkable. Um, but I agree there's definitely an opportunity there, especially since there is so much to walk to in downtown that you don't have in Beaverton. And in Beaverton, we mustn't ignore that between the new part of Beaverton and the old town where you now have all the cool restaurants, you have this like major road that, you know, you get a high chance of running, being run over. So there is still like opportunity in downtown with regards to just what we have here. So yeah, I agree. I don't know. <laughs> I, do, I do think there's a tension. I guess this is the one thing retailers need parking. So I like I do think there's a tension. I think there's an interesting there's like an office residential component. But some of what makes a downtown enjoyable is kind of a concentration of retailers that you can go to, whether it's restaurants or kind of boutique shops or or whatever it is. And they need parking at the very least for delivery. But they also tend to thrive better when somebody can kind of park within relative close proximity to them and walk to them because if you have to walk too far people will go someplace else so and i and there might also i mean i'd be curious about Troy's answer i also think um there we might have gotten out of what like the the how the economics of downtown portland parking works versus the corridors used to be in in alignment like pbot had a very the office of transportation the portland bureau of transportation sorry had like a very clear sense of a hierarchy of when you move from on street parking charged in a certain way or garage parking charged in a certain way to when you move to corridors to when you move to like suburban areas and that was definitely done pre pandemic I don't know that they've gone back and revisited that hierarchy based on what's happening on the ground right now and I think it's a good flag of that could be needed right like because downtown had the highest rates for both garage parking and on-street parking, and it fluctuated the most to on-demand hours, which made sense back in the back before the pandemic. But I think your point about walkable locations is is important because if you look at the suburban, any of the places we're talking about that are doing you know well, it, it's there's a, like a suburban urban environment, right? All of a sudden, it's so different because there is a downtown. Hmm. Beaverton where you could actually walk and yeah. do some things and there's people around an activity so there is something to that you know that be it, whether it's walking or biking but being out and having a variety of amenities and a mix of uses that I think is critical to the type of vibrancy that we want to see downtown so okay um yeah. Uh, Lisa, can you 
you touched on this earlier in the discussion of the arts and downtown Portland and facilities. I was just curious what anyone's opinion is on the Live Nation music venue and how that would affect the local arts. We have an analysis underway. More to come. We we've, we've uh, we asked that question. I mean, I think it's a it's an important it's a an important question. There's lots of different perspectives, I would say. And so we've asked. We actually have a economic analysis firm in town doing an analysis of what has happened. What would they project to happen in Portland? And what um, and actually look at other case study cities where Live Nation has gone into the market. So the question was about oh, the, sorry, the possibility for a Live Nation uh, entertainment venue in downtown downtown Central. 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 and i i do think there's the one thing i would add to that is there is general consensus agreement that the mid size we're we're lacking a mid-size venue I don't, I don't think anybody debates that i think it's more around the like who operates it how is it operated sorry i just it's, wanted to make sure it's, that's it's that. certainly going to be a very attractive venue to go to because of the type of acts that will be attracted to it what it does to the central east side is going to be fascinating to understand and we'll have to learn over time. All right, so we have a, a question on Zoom, and then we have one in, in the room as well after that. So, and our friend on Zoom doesn't have a microphone, so I'm not sure if I saw it. Give dramatic reading. Uh, what are your opinions on making living in urban Portland feel safer and slowing growth of homelessness to make the city space more livable and attractive? I think a lot of people see the city and campus as kind of unsafe and less livable, but they're kind of looking at the same questions. So the question was about about safety and the importance of safety uh, uh, in downtown. It's a it's a big impact. I mean, it's uh, it's not just. The, I mean, first for a while there was I would say was the perception of safety. Now I think it's the reality of safety because crime rates are up and things are happening. So um, that has been a deterrent, and we've heard firsthand from people who are relocating their businesses from the, from the central city to the suburbs or even out of state, that that was a factor for them. So it's definitely a factor. Yeah, the one thing I would say, I, I think we uh, we are pulling apart house, kind of the houselessness, the need for mental health services, the mental kind of the, the need for any number of services from kind of crime and safety. I think those are like, often they get conflated and I think they need to get pulled apart and understand kind of at the root of what is happening. And they all got conflated because folks were not in downtown <laughs> in terms of a mix of uses. But I do think it's important to pull them apart. It's important to acknowledge that our both are having an impact that are distinct impacts. So we have a small business repair grant that has nothing to do with kind of the houselessness, it has to do with small businesses getting broken into on a regular basis and needing to repair their, their windows. And the Joint Office and the Bureau of Housing, uh, like and the um, Portland Housing Bureau are really actively also looking at how do you shelter folks and provide the mental health services. And there's any number of, it's just split between the county and the city, but I think it's important to pull them apart and really come up with um, potential initiatives to address them separately. And it's important to understand that the city doesn't have control over the entire situation. So the county deals with addiction services and mental health services as, as along with the state. We don't. We deal with housing and, and have some some help with the shelters. But so it's the, it's the combination of things and it goes it goes deep financially, going back probably to the Reagan administration, at least when we really started <laughs> breaking down how we care about mental health and and addiction services. So um, it's a super complicated problem, and but it's one that we have bear the brunt of, I think, in the region. There's various reasons for that. Um, there's a higher concentration of it here, but it's a problem that we alone don't hold the answer to. And in, in the short term, what we're seeing is that property owners and businesses hire a private security mm -hmm. firms. So for example, I just live off campus, mm -hmm. and it was for sure an increase in incidents and so for example um across the street from my apartment building there is an affordable senior housing um complex and i've seen sitting on my desk a number of those residents getting attacked by somebody in crisis and so they've hired security and my apartment building has hired security i know psu is patrolling garage three more often i got broken in, in, the, in my car there and I know uh, businesses on, for example, Northwest 23rd teamed up, hired security, the Safeway on 10th, they hired private security. So that is, I think, the immediate response of property owners and businesses 
trying to deal with the situation. Um, but yeah, and long term, it's such a complex issue. Yeah, I mean, the permanent solution, I think, is, you know, takes time and money um, because, I mean, there's the not have not perhaps as being um, as permissive as the city has been with camping in public spaces. But then, you know, I don't think that as a city, you could you just want to move people you know, out of sight, out of mind, like you need people to be going to a place where they're going to get the services they need and an opportunity, you know, to get their needs met. And, and we're not talking about a homogeneous population. There's this a lot of different people with a lot of different issues or reasons that they're in the situation they're in. Um, but to have the housing needed, it's, it takes a long time to build, you know, it's expensive to build and then it's expensive to operate because some of those folks that are hardest to house need um, very, you know, significant wraparound services to remain successful in, in housing and that would encompass the mental health and other types of services people need. So it's a, it's a big, you know, it would requires a, a big investment. And, and to be fair, the cities, you know, as voters, we've approved some bonds that have provided resources that we didn't have in the past that have provided a number of units, including, you know, what's called permanent supportive housing that has those supportive services. It's just the need is so much, you know, greater than the resources. Uh, question here. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, um, I appreciate you touching on like housing and all the important aspects of the city. And, uh, Kind of adding on to that, um, I've always thought that an important factor is being able to, you know, bring people together uh, to be able to get around. Um, I live downtown on campus and I don't have a car, and I've always thought that an idea would be transit-oriented development. Um, are you guys uh, working? Are we working with like a uh, city? Are we working with some our transit agencies to kind of look at that in terms of the downtown corridor? So the question was about transit-oriented development. Uh, yeah, I mean, downtown, it's a little trickier because there's no major station area. There's the transit mall itself. Um, and But I mean, for instance, the, Jill mentioned that Gary is working on the um, OMSI station area and we've been focused on that. So it's an area where we up zone the area, change the zoning to allow for mixed use residential and commercial office and institutional uses increase the densities of it as well, and then did that around the transit investment that happened there. So typically when we do a new transit line, we will find key station areas and we will do some significant up zoning and thinking about it, some master planning on some level about it. So that is is happening. How that factors into downtown is tricky and I don't see any major transit uh, uh, investment you know, soon, <laughs> unfortunately, but that would be a factor in that. There has been talk about perhaps there being a subway connection from the east side to the west side to speed the uh, the, the pace of which you come through the downtown on light on max because you effectively become streetcar once you get into the central city. Um, and that would allow for fewer stops and those stop locations are definitely places we would look at to try to go bigger. Uh, yeah, so uh, I just want to talk about amenities. Um, as someone who's new to Portland, I've been very struck by the really vibrant neighborhoods that exist here in Portland. Um, so I was kind of curious about um, has the pace of downtown, you know, bouncing back um, been something of a function of like the vibrancy of like suburban areas elsewhere? So the question was about the relationship between downtown and neighborhoods or you know i don't know suburban you mean like neighborhoods within the city yeah, or yeah. uh so the connection between the vibrancy of downtown and, and the neighborhoods so i'm going to try and take this one because we do right I, I mentioned that we were both doing a central city analysis by sub district and corridor analysis um i think it really depends on the corridor um and there's any number of things it depends on um, kind of where the real estate market was um, as the corridor went into the pandemic. It depends on how well organized of a business district that corridor had going through the pandemic. It depends on who lived around the corridor in terms of both income level and kind of how stable was it 
um, because most, at least if you were um, adjacent to people who were working from home, you did well, right? Like, so mostly white collar workers, if you were adjacent to folks who were still coming into work, you didn't necessarily kind of do as well, or you didn't see a blip. Um, and then I also think some of the find some of the early findings is also going to probably be about how safe it is to cross that corridor to get from one side to another in terms of small businesses. So that's a long winded way of saying I, I think there are certain corridors who benefited from folks being at home versus um, and I think there's a lot of curiosity of what does it mean for the future of those corridors if that collective workforce is continuing to be working from home for certain days. And I think there are corridors who did not do well. And the last thing I would say is also when we're thinking about the corridors who did well, particularly when you get into more vulnerable communities, thinking about how that's actually an indication of coming displacement or displacement that's already there is gonna be one of, because as opposed to downtown where the Pearl District was built, right? Like the Pearl District was the most resilient. It was built on a rail yard. You were not kind of putting folks and the affordable housing is regulated affordable housing. You're not putting people at risk. If you're talking about X corridor out in East Portland that is starting to see kind of is performing very well and their retail lease rates are going up. That is an indication that in fact, you're gonna have small businesses and likely residents who are gonna to start to be displaced if they're not already being displaced. And we need to think about investing in those corridors. So I think there are court, it really depends on where you were in the market cycle going in and where you were in the city and what the fabric around that corridor was doing. What is an example for one that is doing really well and one that is deteriorating or like struggling? Um, super good question. So I'm going to give you, it's fascinating. We actually thought this was interesting. Um, one that's doing well, because I'll use it, is actually 42nd Avenue in North Northeast, which is a neighborhood prosperity network area. And it's interesting. Because if you look at it, the lease rates are increasing, um, and yet the businesses are stable because there was a neighborhood prosperity network, in part mm -hmm. because there was a neighborhood prosperity network area there that was really facilitating the businesses being able to stay and actually buying property before the pandemic to help stabilize. There are segments there. Are, I, I think the ones that I would highlight, um, Southwest Corridor is challenged, is was challenged going through the pandemic in terms of increased um, vacancy rates and decreased kind of lease rates. And there are, there are segments of 82nd Avenue. And I think we're still in the process of trying to decipher how much can you lump that into like, here's the reason or reasons versus no, you really have to be site specific, community specific about how you're thinking about addressing those issues. It's definitely a good point that you're bringing up the retail, using retail as an indicator of where neighborhood is going. Um, and, and Troy mentioned it earlier, like all the cool Portland brand opening up uh, stores in Lake Oswego and in Beaverton and in Hillsboro. And that for sure um, shows that actually those areas, and I know they're not urban, but they're suburban and definitely benefited from what's going on here on the Central East Side and downtown. Um, so yeah, it's interesting to see them. There's a study. <laughs> okay. Thanks very much to the panel. This is a very stimulating, in many ways, sobering and daunting discussion. It's profound, both in terms of the way we think about urban studies and planning, and especially urban economies, as well as our daily lives. So Amazon is 40% of downtown Seattle. Our president, Steve, now likes to say that Portland State owns 14% of downtown Portland. So not quite 40, but nevertheless, a substantial landowner role in our place. Uh, fascinating to hear the talk culture as a key element, placemaking, activating places. We're doing a little bit of that as we speak as part of this 50th anniversary celebration on Montgomery Street, closed to traffic. There'll be a major cultural event there during the day tomorrow. It's been ongoing, will continue through November. So my thanks to the Dean's office staff, Kaya Mendoza, Aaron Sutherland, Sarah Violante, and Jonathan Wolf for producing all of the events that we've had here in our remodeled library. Sarah Violante has been overseeing that. The work's still in progress, but we're getting closer to being done here and we will 
continue to use this space for these kinds of activities. So thanks to everybody, both in the room as well as zooming in for attending today. There's lots to think about and lots of actions that need to be taken. So thank you very, very much.